Pastor John was talking about timing, about the baby coming this morning and apparently being delayed. That timing, the delay, of, the delay of that child, or the delay of that child, was crucial over what happened at the Yokefellow Institute Friday night and Saturday. And I was thinking about that, so sitting there listening to him. And when he mentioned timing, so many times God's servants are saying words that are so very, very important, but it's hard to grasp the seriousness, you know, of what they're saying. And uh, but I happen to have a fresh experience, so I I was more alert to that particular phrase, less less alert to others. Although to just talk about donkeys, God knowing where donkeys are, I get alert to that over its uniqueness, you know. So I'm so glad he knew where those donkeys were. And then he's got a topic here tonight, perhaps he would have been sharing this morning, that I'm already so fascinated over. Uh, it's already answered. It satisfies my soul for him just to give us that scripture. So I'm fed already. But had, had, the, had the baby come earlier then she would have been on the road like a normal mother without having any check of the Holy Spirit. She would have been gone into North Carolina because in two days the baby comes home and she's going to be there to help along with uh, Toby's mother. Toby's mother is working. So Barbara's free and she'll be home to help, you know, to help this child. And uh, But had she gone... We could not have responded to the call that came into the car telephone just before I left. And I'm so surprised Kathleen's gone. Because I talked to her Friday. And she was calling me because a call came in from Richmond to ask Oliver and Barbara to come in prepared to sit on the platform with the United States Senate chaplain Friday night. And after I talked with James, I, I found out that the, the thing that got him to us was more Barbara than me. Uh, why not? Uh, but my closeness to Dr. Trueblood in, in, the, in the commission of writing the book, you might have, I might have presumed, well, the connection there and being chaplain for a day in 82 at the United States Senate with, with uh, our chaplain, our great chaplain, uh, being with him, get acquainting with him, find out what a wonderful person he was. I might have assumed that, but he was looking on the platform for someone of beauty and of certain art and conversation to set between Dr. Trueblood and one of the head bishops of the Episcopal Church. He may be the highest, I don't know, but he's quite a wonderful fellow, and we were just marvelously thrilled with his sermon yesterday. That's a fact, we were just, we, we were in for a big surprise. These conferences can sometimes either be the deadest things or they can be more alive than you thought they'd be. This one had power and it had anointing in it, and uh, Jesus really helped us. But see, he was looking for Barbara to sit between the bishop and Dr. Trueblood. Well, I didn't, she didn't know that. If I had told her that on the way down, we would have had, she'd have gone to see the daughter, I think, before the baby came. <laughs> goodbye, bishop. Goodbye, Dr. Trueblood. <laughs> but she had a time. This bishop n knows Madame Lingle, who's also Episcopal, and it's given her, uh, she, Madame Lingle, the writer that wrote, most of the young people know, The Wrinkle in Time, is a beautiful trilogy. Well, she's written a lot of other things. I think her book's now a bestseller on, on the big markets, two-part invention or something like that about her life. And she's quite, an, quite a writer like Catherine Marshall, only now her writings have exceeded Catherine Marshall's. And she's uh, ministering to people across the board. So... Uh, the bishop's going to get do something by getting her acquainted uh, or some connection here with Madame Langle. She's so excited over that, she forgot about, you know, sitting between the bishop and Dr. Trueblood. And uh, she was good company, and they liked her, and they just had a marvelous time. And uh, But see, it was important for her to be there. But had she not been with me, then probably would, we wouldn't have been on the platform. Because if I understand James Newby right, Dr. Newby, who's now in charge of Yokefella Institute since Dr. Trueblood is as retired in the East, why I wouldn't have been on the platform. 
And so, but I was on a platform, and as a result, I see Dr. Halverson was here, and Elizabeth Newby was here, and then I was here. I was third one. And uh, our people were out front. There was two whole rows of people, 24 people uh, came to see me. That's what they told me. <laughs> and uh, it just got me. It got me. So now, Pastor, we're glad the United States Simplin Chaplain's here. We're glad that Dr. Trueblood's here. But we come to see you. So that's why we're here. And uh, I, this, that love has touched me. I can't explain. I just never thought much about somebody coming to see me, even my own people. <laughs> so I had a time. We were blessed Friday and Saturday. But you've been away, with, away from them. You've seen them for almost 20 years, three to 400 people, and you love them, every one, you know. And... Uh, uh, I had that experience of sitting there, Barbara and I at the table, head table yesterday. I sent Monty and Sandy, my secretary and her husband, out to find a place for lunch, and they found a Holiday Inn. And I mean, in two hours, those people had, uh, a, they had a nice room for us and had soup and had uh, dip and had uh, sandwiches. And I mean, they just took us in, just like a banquet, what it was like, at 1 o'clock. And uh, we were there for a couple of hours with them. But... What I'm leading to is this timing, Pastor. You said that. So I thought, well, she had to be there. That was important. And that's why James wanted her with the bishop. He felt like the bishop would enjoy her, knowing Barbara's interest and all. And Dr. Trueblood's loved Barbara very much uh, since I brought her up after we got re reacquainted. I'd gone to school under Trueblood uh, about 24 years ago. But I'm sitting over here, and when I found out we were going to be there when Sandy and Monty were trying to help us get ready, and I, I, I ran off to this conference with no shirts. I took everything but my white shirts, and it's 45 minutes, and I'm supposed to be on this stage of, of I, I guess you'd say, the most prestigious people in the United States. I don't hardly know anybody except the president, and here I get in. I'm getting everything ready, and I've got even my braces, the suspenders, and everything. I'm all ready. But I can't go in a T-shirt or wrap a tie around my T-shirt. And it's, it's, it's service. I mean, uh, it's at 6. It, the banquet's at 6.30. We're supposed to leave at 6 o'clock. It's 15 to 6, and I have no, I have no shirt. And uh, that is a situation. And so it just, we sent Monty down. Monty went down and it bought me my neck size and hurried back. The iron was hot. Sandy was up there. Uh, Barbara's hem fell out. She was trying to put the hem in. And now, you ought to know about that. Something important is about to happen. I mean, if you run into that many things, we'd already run into a few others. But if you're 45 minutes before sitting on one of the most prestigious stages in the United States and the hem's out of the skirt, you know, I think she pulled it a little bit and then the whole thing went. And and here here I am. I've got my suit and the shoes. I've got everything. All I'm ready to go. I'm shaved. I went over to get my shirts. I said, where, where is my shirt? Oh, I left those shirts home. And so Monty had to go out and buy me a new shirt. And uh, and to get that iron, to get that on, and then try to make it look like it's not new. You know, to get the wrinkles up. Well, listen, that's some assignment. Because, <laughs> you know, man doesn't want to sit there with a crinkle right there. That says, you know, he just put that on. That means he just unwrapped that and put that on. Well, I, that may not bother you, but that bothers me. I want them to think that I thought about things and, or somebody did for me. And, you know, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. So, so I'm sitting over here. And just before we get up there, it comes to me. Now, this is unlike me. It comes to me that, uh, that I might give the manuscript to Dr. Halverson. And that's a little unlike me because it just is. I just would, might send it by mail because we became acquainted and he asked about our story and I said, well, maybe I'll write something about it one of these days. But I said, Sandy, you've got a manuscript? She said, yes. I said, bring that with you. I said, I don't know, but I might give it to Dr. Halverson. It, who knows? And I may and I may not. I don't know. And I was sitting on the stage and here were our people right out front when we were introduced he introduced Barbara and I, James and Elizabeth first, and then Barbara and Oliver, and had a stand and said, now these people have developed, and it's only by God's grace and glory, one of the most wonderful churches, one of the most vital churches in all of America. Well, that's quite a thing, because these people are all over here. See, it's a tremendous witness for Jesus, and 
Brother Helm's ministry and how God sent us down there. And, and, uh, and he said, and the proof of it is, look at these people. There, I think we had 22, 3 people stand up, 25 with Barbara and I. And, um, uh, and uh, they stood right up, right in the middle, and you could hear the oohs and the old because that's quite a representation to come, you know, two to 300 miles. So there's a tremendous witness made there. And so, uh, but before that, I said, I motioned to Sandy to bring me the, to the manuscript, and I noticed he wasn't doing anything much because people were talking and all during the meal. And I just went over and I said, Doctor, I spoke to you that I might send you our story one of these days if I ever wrote it on paper. It was in 84 when the Holy Spirit operated, when Dr. Truba had said, we want you to write this book. And I, when Brother Helm called, I said, what is Jesus telling me? He said, to write a book. And I said, oh, what am I going to write a book on? He said, why, church number six? He said, you've got a lot to write about. He encouraged me to get started. So we got this small manuscript written. I put it over in front of Dr. Halverson. I said to him, sir, I said, if this is too much of a bother, I'll mail it to you because I know sometimes they travel with little bags. He said, no. He said, uh, I would like to take this home and read it tonight. I'd like to have this with me tonight. So I left it with him. Went back to my seat, and it came time for him to speak, and he got up with his Bible, and he got up with a manuscript. Now, I'm talking about timing, John. The baby did not need to come earlier because she'd have been gone, and James chose her, primarily was thinking of her and what she could share in the art of conversation and ministry with this bishop and Dr. Trueblood. So he gets up with the manuscript, and he opens the manuscript, and he looks at the people and said, Now, Oliver's given me this manuscript. We spoke about it in 82, about him writing something. And he said, I have this manuscript. And he said, I just want to read this to you. It's the Scott Depot story, Mission Without Strategy, how one church is discovering its mission through obedience rather than methods. And he turns around, looks at me, and he says, Hallelujah! <laughs> and that is the theme of his message. That's what he brought in again and again and again. And he preached under an anointing. He preached under power. He's, he's, he's tired of methods. <laughs> he's tired of traditions getting in the way. He said, we ought to be obeying the Holy Spirit. We ought to be obeying God. Well, can you imagine my shock? You can imagine. I said, Jesus, I almost didn't get my shirt on, the hems out of the garments. Uh, <laughs> if, now, and John, uh, Pastor John said timing. Uh, and if that baby had been here earlier, it, you wouldn't, it doesn't take much, mother much. She'd have been gone. She'd just been gone. But as it was... We found out while we were uh, that night that she was in labor and the baby came this morning and because, I guess, the largeness of the child came by cesarean, the mother and baby's fine. And now this afternoon she went to Scott Depot with, with our Scott Depot church. Then she's on her way down. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. But, but you see how important timing is there? Have you ever thought about God might delay a baby? You ever thought about that? Well, you know, our third child, Naomi, was delayed one month. She's a 10-month baby. Barbara was in labor and was near going to the hospital for delivery. And it was not appropriate for me to give the signs, but the signs were that the time was right. I mean, we were ready to, she was ready to go. But you see, the community was upset with me because I was leaving over my child being born. They were upset about that, and there was lots of uh, fussing, the fussing over this preacher that leave his wife uh, when she's about to have a baby. And uh, Wink Doss, Wendell Doss, who was then a chairman of the board, said, you know, Pastor, it's something how this community was upset over you leaving, you're having to leave and obey God, to go obey God over there with the baby about to come. He said, I, I played professional baseball, and he said, both of my children were born while I was on the ball field. And he said, there wasn't one complaint in the community. He said, everybody thought he was just wonderful. I'm loud in my voice because I'm aggravated the devil. Think of it. 
think of it. They was ready to scratch my eyes out because this pastor was going abroad trying to put God first in his life and his baby might, his baby might come while he's gone, but a professional man has both child, both children are born while, with, without him being there to comfort his wife. And he said there wasn't one, one word of complaint ever. Why, sure, he had to play baseball, didn't he? And there he enters people's mind that you may have to obey God and be gone in some foreign country and God, God, but you know what the Lord did? He spared us that criticism. The moment the plane left the ground, her labor stopped. Stopped. When I called from the Ginnazar kibbutz, I thought, sure, I had a child. I said, honey, how are you? How are we doing? <laughs> Is there another? She said, no. She said, I've been shopping with your mother today. She said, the minute you left the ground, she said, it all stopped, and we're just waiting. Naomi was a 10-month tenth tenth month baby. She came, she came days after I got back. And see, it stopped all in the community. See, God didn't want that. Isn't that tremendous? Yeah. Timing. Yeah. Timing. So you can have a ten you can have a ten month baby and she's a healthy one. Yeah. I mean she's healthy. She's healthier in her birth and in her younger life, she's healthier than the other children. So I thought that I wanted to say that. This is a long prelude. I may not get to the main sermon. But uh, there's a lot in the prelude. <laughs> because it's number three in the prelude. One is I want to thank God for what I see in the eyes of John and Jan's children. When I look into these children's eyes, I see love for me. I mean deep love. I mean the kind of love you want. The kind of love you need. See, I've looked at their eyes this morning. It's the kind of love you need. I saw such purity in their eyes when they looked at me a while ago. And I said, oh my God, help me, Jesus. But I will tell you where that love came from. The ultimate source is our Lord. But that's the love that's in mother and daddy. Or it'd never be in those children. Because if mother and daddy were offended with me, it would show in the children. Unless they had reached a certain plateau, great victory spiritually, and they're all climbing just like the rest of us to the place. But see, there's such purity, such love, so deep in those children. I thought of in Leviticus. He said, if you, he put a, he said, Israel, if you don't obey me, he said, I will send the wild beast among you which shall rob you of your children. And that's way back there in the law. And one day, one day, some children, 42 or 43 of them were out playing and they made fun of a man of God and hollered at him and said, Go up thy old baldy. I tell you, some bears came out of the woods and ate those children right up. Just gobbled them up. That's, and it bothers a liberal mind so much. But our Lord said, Israel, if you don't obey me, now where did, it wasn't those children's fault. They all landed in glory. They were, they were below the age of accountability. But where in the world did making fun of a bald-headed preacher come from? It came over the breakfast table. It came in the night. They heard mom and daddy talk about an old bald-headed preacher. So they just made fun of him. Old bald-headed preacher. God just took those bears out. Just, just chewed them up. He had warned them a hundred years or more. Uh, before that, he says, listen, if you don't obey me, I'll send the beast out of the field and I'll eat your children up. Yes, sir. Something, isn't it? Yes, sir. So I just, that's prelude number three. Yeah. I just wanted to say, oh, how wonderful it is to have this love. Glory be to God forevermore. Right. Isn't it something that he warned them about that hundreds of years before? I found that through reading the Bible. The other thought, I guess, is this. Brother Helm has uh, shared with us, he thinks John's here forever until Jesus comes. So I don't know, you know, I just wanted to kind of say that. What they've given up, oh, mercy me, I didn't have that much to give up when I left everything to try to go with Jesus. But oh, how we ought to appreciate. I was there. I saw it happen. I saw them give up. John's influence was strong from Charleston to West to Huntington and beyond. And he was considering, he was considered a leading executive of, all, of many things. I mean, they, his reputation and his influence and his humility and his ability was so great that uh, if you had been there to see all this take place, why, but you appreciate it by way of report, 
And so uh, the price they've paid by God's grace and mercy and the minister they have both here and outside is so wonderful. I'm glad I'm a part of it and, and I'm, I'm here uh, under him. He's my pastor also. That's why I'm up here. By God's grace and by God's mercy. Praise the Lord for his grace. I, I have the heart uh, uh, Brother Ham tells me it's somewhere between 80 and 90 years old. And <clears throat> so when God healed my heart, he didn't heal it like restore it like a young man but he restored the heart he healed it where it was that is he stopped its aging and so it's it's there and uh, to be away Friday and Saturday if I look weary it's because two days of being down there with the people and this kind of pressure it makes me so tired but when I woke up this morning I said Jesus now get up uh, he told me I could stay home today he told me that two days ago that I had pastor's permission but I felt like I had to be here to get something for my soul. I felt like I had to... See, I need soul food worse than I need rest. And, and I, when I get soul food, well, that helps me by God's grace and mercy. So we'll... And I've had it. I've had it in the music this morning. I've had it in the singing. When they sing, when they sing the best of rooms a while ago, that operated in my heart. It said the best. Well, that fed my soul. I said, Jesus, I want to choose for you. Just as soon as that witness came, I just felt like I wanted to I wanted to be you know I was convicted I wanted to give Jesus the best and has something to do with a sermon today now, I thought Jesus would surely pass me by today because uh, th this is I don't seem to ever be prepared and and this is one of those mornings when I'm trembling because I'm about halfway through understanding something I got a hold of a little a little end of some one of the biggest things in the world but I haven't pulled enough string out yet to, to understand it too well, you know. So is it all right if I, if I get started and I don't finish? Maybe I, can, maybe I can finish when I get back. But I'm excited about what I got a hold of. It's just a little bitty thing. But, but I know what, what back of it is so great that uh, we'll just trust Jesus. See, I need to study more. I need to understand more. I need to hold on God for revelation because when you're talking about the blood of Christ... You're in the deepest thing there is in the universe. So I'll try to share a little bit. And then if I just quit in the middle while everybody be encouraged, maybe Pastor John will help me finish when I get back. And uh, I don't know. It might be part of my resurrection sermon. Anyway, uh, the passage comes from Colossians. And uh, it's in Colossians 1.20. It's, it's just this text. Remember, I've been preaching on the blood now five or six times. And in Colossians 1 and 20, and let's get the context of it here, where he says that Christ, in the 15th verse, we'll start with the 12th verse, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, this is Christ, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Oh, we could preach a long time on that. All things are created by Jesus, and all things are created for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I've, I've tried to preach on that text, that in all things he might be first, for it pleased the Father, then in him should all fullness dwell. And here's the text. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth and things in heaven. We must add the first part of 21 and you. Things in heaven and things, or things in earth, things in heaven and you. 
And uh, the, the commentators, the Bible st- scholars say, be sure and put and you on there because it's a part of this reconciliation by God's grace. The phrase that's on my mind today since we've been speaking on the blood is the blood of the cross. I'm not sure. I haven't had time to study. I, I'm, I'm in a shape when it comes to my library. I've got a commentary on Colossians. No, commentary on uh, Acts, one on several in Hebrews and one or two others and 50 sets at home. <laughs> so I'm a... You say, why is that important? Well, I really want to know what the Greek says here. But in looking at the New American Standard, I'm pretty sure that the Greek says the blood of the cross. And this translation, NIV, changes it. So, so I'm pretty sure that it says the blood of the cross. In fact, I, I'm... I'm real sure of that, because of the New American Standard, which tries to hold closer to the Greek or closer to the Hebrew. It's a little rougher, a little rougher than NIV. But I've used the old King James, the old anointed text this morning, because it says the blood of the cross, because that is something that's upon my heart that I want to share about this morning. That's an unusual phrase. It may be used only once in all of scriptures. We say the blood of Christ. We say the cross of Christ. But in this case, it says the blood of the cross. The blood of the cross. Now, I had an experience coming down from the, from the amount of temptation one day that I've never understood, and maybe until the last one or two days. But it has something to do with this phrase. We went up on the mount of, I was right after my heart trouble and had to be careful, but God gave us all strength to go up. If you remember, we went down to St. George's and back up. That's what the name of that was, that monastery over there in that valley. We went down and God kept us from having sore legs and all. And then we, on the same day, we went up to the Mount of Temptation there, which overlooks Jericho, and we got to visit that monastery there. And it was on the way down, I, just before I got to the bus, suddenly I had a revelation that I could hardly explain. But it brought tears to my eyes. And as I look back at the place that commemorates the, the, where Christ overcame the devil, where, where after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, in, that, in the power of the Holy Spirit, but in his humanity as he depended upon God, I looked back at the Mount of Temptation, and I was uh, the devil's buffeting me over some over some past disobediences and all. And I looked back at the Mount of, of Temptation, and I said, "Because Christ gained the victory, I too have the victory." See, that came to me right there, right there, and I haven't thought of it till I got to this passage here. I said, "Because He gained the victory there, I'm not to the cross yet." I'm not even there yet. Because I want you to know, now if you hear me out, if you won't make any judgment in your mind, you're, you're, please don't. Would you Would you just hang on until I get through? And I, since I don't have half the sermon, you may have to hang on for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've been wonderful with me. There's, as far as I know, pleading the blood of Christ, no spirit since I've been here has played itself against me. Did you know that? And that may, it, it may change but that if... If you can keep that way, I don't know what may happen to me. I might go back. One of the best preachers that's ever hit. I wouldn't ever know it, of course. But you know, I don't know what might happen to me. But see, God's given me such freedom here with you. Your hearts are so precious. We we'll, one of the one of the advantages I have is I don't know anything much. I don't need to know anything much. I can just preach and have a time. I can run through troubles and I can do all kinds of things, upset devils and everything else, and nearly everyone here knows that I don't know anything. That's good, isn't it? But, but if, when God does that with me, you can get a hold of it because uh, you know Jesus is speaking. Now, Jesus does that through the pastor too, but it makes it a little rougher because he's been here longer. And see, I have that problem at home. I get tied up. Because I'll be preaching along this, having a wonderful time. Won't be thinking about anything. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. it's right there it is. I know what happened. Somebody thought I was after them personally. And I've even got that right. I've even got that right. Paul said, I hear these things, I hear these things are happening among you. 
But you wouldn't want to do that unless you're in the Spirit. People are so offended if they think you know anything direct. Isn't it something? We were even taught in psychology class that the people can't hardly take direct suggestion. So we have to learn that as ministers too. We don't. We, we like to stay away from that. We just like to preach the gospel and preach the principles and let the Holy Spirit apply it to the heart because if you get it by indirect suggestion, that is, if you feel that God's talking to you and the preacher's not doing it, you're more apt to accept it by God's grace. So I, that's part of the explanation. That's not all of it. There's something great about this group of people. It's beyond that. There's something great in your hearts. It's beyond that. There's something great about being here in this place. Because when we mention being here near the, the will of God or here in the perfect will of God, the Holy Spirit operates. Right, exactly. And see, that's exciting. Yeah. So we won't try to figure all that out. We'll just be grateful and give God all the praise and the glory. But I'm back and I'm, I'm looking up at the Mount of Temptation and I said, Jesus, and here's where I whipped the devil because he's an accuser of the brethren. I said, because Christ won that victory for me and overcame the devil there, I have a victory now because the blood of the cross points to a fact that it points to the disposition of Christ. Where did the cross get its value? It got its value over his disposition. The value of the cross, the blood of the cross, its power and its value comes from his disposition. What was his disposition? It was a disposition to never satisfy himself, never exercise self-assertiveness, never have his own, his own way, always do the will of his Father. So in doing that, he, came, he became clear, free of sin, but he could have committed sin. He chose not to do it. He chose not to even satisfy uh, his own legitimate desires in, in a wrong way. You see, that's what happened. That's what happened on the Mount of Temptation. See, I'm pointing to his disposition now. See, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says immediately he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Yes. Now, brother, you're, you're in my life's at stake. Because for the first time, a man is in the flesh... And he's got his life open, the second Adam, to the full power of God. Now, either God wins this battle or the devil does. And what Jesus was proving was, he was proving that without his, without his own means and without his own efforts and in any fleshly way, if any person in the flesh relying on the power of God could overcome the temptations of the devil. And when he did that, when he did that, in essence, he broke the power of Satan right there. You see, God, God overcame the devil in that place. That victory was a victory that had to be before he got to Calvary. She said, I'll give you the proof. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. The Bible said he was perfected. doesn't mean he was ever sinful. It doesn't mean when a baby has a little muscle that that muscle's imperfect, that muscle's perfect. But there is a perfection to come, see, through experience. There's a perfection to come through use that will help it for the day ahead. Christ was not ready in his 15 years old or 17 years old or 18 year old. It was at the launching of his ministry at 30 years old, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Then, you see, then and then all of his life up to that moment got him ready for that. And that victory got him ready for another victory. I know, see, I don't have it down very pat, but, oh, if you'll hang on to it, just chew on it with me, maybe God will give you the revelation of it, and you'll preach. When you get it, you'll preach to somebody. You'll get, you'll get the wife up in the night and say, Honey, get on the light. I got it. <laughs> get the light on. Get the children out. I want to tell them where this victory first came. Listen, here it is. The cross was only a symbol the cross was an outward manifestation of an inward disposition. The cross was something he carried all of his life. The power of the cross was in the God-man. It was there. And when, we, when he overcame at the Mount of Temptation, and when he overcame Peter, see how we have to overcome right there? 
through the mouth of friends, he had said, I, it must be, I've got to die. I've got to go and die. The Son of Man, that touches my heart. He's going to have to die. I'm going to be buried and raised the third day. And, and Peter said, oh, no. He said, get behind me, Satan. Because somebody's always saying, oh, no. Oh, no. Somebody's already said to me, when I get through Easter Sunday, if possible, perhaps I can take my daughter and I can make my way down into North Carolina and see the baby. And I said, but maybe not. And their response was, oh, no. I rebuke the oh, no's. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the oh, no's. Why is it? Because I don't want to be down there unless God wants to be down there. Baby or no baby. I can still remember the daughter of Phineas, I believe it was, one Eli's grand, uh, granddaughter, I believe it was, when the baby came. And everybody was excited like they are with the baby. They said, oh, it's a baby. And everybody's excited. And she said, name the baby Ichabod. The glory is departed. Brother, I don't know whether, I think the Bible says we're supposed to cry when they're born and rejoice when they die. Man's days are full of trouble and sin's getting most of them and most people aren't going to find a narrow way. So I don't know why people are so happy over babies and I'm thankful. I'm thrilled and I'm thankful God's given us this child and there's special circumstances why this child means so much to this daughter and this son-in-law of ours. We're happy about that. But I'm not happy enough to go down there out of order. Why? It isn't the disposition of the cross. There's no victory in it. You see, he carried the cross all of his life. And I want you to know, whenever he got out there in the, in, the, in the wilderness, those were good things. Bread was good things. The devil had the kingdoms of the world. They were going to be his anyway. But the devil wanted to get him to worship him and give him the kingdoms, something that always was law, already lawfully his, but would not be presented unto him until this great sacrifice was made then everything would be put under his feet. He had it coming anyway. See that we've got all good things. Everything is ours. It's all coming anyway. But the devil wants us to shortchange it because he wants us to do a little something, to get a little something ahead of time or out of order or something that seemeth right and it isn't right at all because God can see all things. So I looked up the Mount of Temptation and I knew then I had a revelation enough to know that because he overcame the devil there, I have the victory now by God's grace. It is, it is, it is, it is possible for me if I choose not to be self-assertive and I choose to deny self to have the same power come down in my heart that Jesus had, that came down in his heart because he didn't, he did not exercise the command of his second person of the Trinity. He just did what his father said and relied upon his father and lived just like you and just like me. Those miracles were miracles that his father wanted. And those false gospels that are written in one of the false gospels, the way we, way we know it's a false gospel is because it said Jesus was a little boy and there were some ants that bothered him in the night and he got up and cursed those ants. Don't you believe it at all? That's why it's not in scriptures. That's a story. He didn't do any such thing. And it's not, there's no witness on that at all. There's some gospels circulating like that. They call them pseudo-gospels. Why, well, he never misused his power one time. See, the great glory of this New Testament is, he said, I just always do what my Father says. And so then when the devil came, he could find nothing in him. The devil had no territory on which to base. So you've got to see that the blood of the cross points to his disposition. It points to the disposition that in as a man he would never choose for himself what he wanted. He would only choose what his father wanted. See, it's the disposition. There's the power of the cross. See, not in Calvary here now, having won, having won this great victory on the Mount of Temptation because the devil was tempting him and having rebuked Peter and having not gotten with their spirit when they wanted to fall, call fire down on those who disagreed with him. He never got in with those things because, he, because his heart revealed the love of the Father for all men. But when he got into Gethsemane and on to Calvary, especially at Gethsemane, we really had the crux of the battle as to whether God's will will be, will be done in a man through the second Adam because it was no small thing at all that he took 
He took his our sins up upon Himself. See, because the glory, He had never been separated from His Father, and He had never tasted death. But because He tasted death, you and I never have to taste death. You and I will never have to say, really, in the Spirit, we'll never have to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's never forsaken us, and He never will. If we love Him and we're under the blood of Christ, we're never forsaken. He gave us a promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's what He said. And then we're with Him forever anyway. See, it's a great thing. So when He got in Calvary, when He got in there, you see, His disposition, His nature, I heard Brother Helm say it. He said, the cross is something Jesus carried all of His life. We've got to realize this because therein in the revelation thereof is where our own power source is or is not. I mean, if we deny it, then we, we, don't, we won't have the power. So it points, the blood of the cross points to His disposition. Remember, it was the power of sin that was broken first. That is, the power of the devil was broken. He was whipped right there. I mean, he had a man filled with God. A man filled with God. The first Adam would had that power also, but he canceled it by his sin. This Adam was filled with the power of God, by God's grace and by God's mercy. And whenever he said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, and he quoted the word of God back of him, I'm telling you the devil suffered a humiliating defeat, and we're still reaping the victory of that. And we shall reap it from now on. Great victory right there. Carried him on past Peter. Carried him on. And here comes Samaria. And he likes to go on around. Because the Jews are hated and no man likes to go where he's hated. He had the same feelings and the same temptations as us. And they looked at him and said, Surely you're not going up through there. And he said, It, it must needs be. I've got to go through Samaria. Look at it. See, look at it. He could have stepped sideways right there. Here's the, Why? Because he carried the cross then. And with, in carrying the cross then, he had the power of God with him. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. It was never short-circuited. It was never diminished. See, God's power is with him. So he met that one. Look what a glorious thing. Here's a place you don't want to go to. Here's a place you, they don't even, his own people don't even recognize him. Now he's going to get somewhere where the, where the hatred could be double. And he meets a woman at the well who said, He told me all things I ever did. Glory be to God. And he, it was so exciting for him that when they got back to give him food, he didn't even want any food. He said, my food is, is to do the will of my Father. Oh, can you see the victory in it? He wasn't even hungry. He wasn't hungry. So, oh, just pass self-denial. Just pass the defeat of the devil. There's such fulfillment. There's such joy. It's so wonderful that the appetite leaves. And you've been at the table yourself. When someone was across the table, and by God's grace you were staying in order... And all of a sudden you find yourself so excited and you were telling a story and they brought a meal and it was hot and you were thinking about it. And then after a while, you were sharing a while and the meal got cold. And when it came time to eat the meal, you didn't even want it. What happened? Same thing happened to Jesus. When they got there with the food, the glory of God was so great. The will of God is so great until you don't, you don't want it anymore. And I remember when Sister Kay McCall was converted. She said, see, she thought that Buddha was for the Japanese and that Jesus was for the Americans. But when she died in her bed, Jesus was at the foot of that bed. She was still in the body. Jesus was at the foot of that bed. She said immediately she knew that Jesus was the Savior. Immediately she knew that He was the Son of God. And immediately she knew that He had died for her sin. She knew everything in the twinkling of an eye. She knew it right then. Imagine. She didn't read the Bible. She thought that her husband, who was Christian, that was all for him, but she was Buddha. Shinto and Buddha, it's kind of a mixture, uh, uh, syncretism there, mix, mixed up sort of a thing. And so when Jesus was there, and she, what she said to Jesus, she's looking around, she said, oh, Jesus, forgive me. He was right there, right there. She said, oh, Jesus, forgive me. And uh, she said that, it, that he, he nodded twice, which in Japanese is yes. And she was forgiven and the life came back. The air came back. The air started moving around her by God's grace. And she, she went home and her husband said he'd wake up in the night and she'd be in another room. And the light would be on. And she'd be reading the Bible all night long. And said the next day she'd be reading the Bible. 
and she'd read it all day. And the next night, he'd, he, she'd be out of the bed. She'd be in another room. She'd be reading the Bible all night long, and she didn't eat. She was in a fast, an involuntary fast. She wasn't hungry at all. Guess what was feeding her? The Word of God. The Word of God was feeding her. Just fed her and fed her and fed her. What a glorious experience. You see the parallel here? You see what happened? You see, there's great things beyond self-denial. The way of the cross, you see, Jesus demonstrated it for us. He was telling us how to live then. Of course, we couldn't have done it if, if something else hadn't happened at the cross. If He didn't, then go on to the cross, take our sins upon Himself and die and shed that blood which satisfied the wrath of God and did something else. That blood went into heaven and took out all the guilt that was ever registered there. All that record, all that stuff was written down against us. That's where heaven was cleansed. And when that happened, then it opened up the gate for us. There was nothing standing between us and God. So you see, there was power over sin first. Then when he, when at the climax of the cross, then our guilt was removed. So it comes to us in reverse. Power for Him first. Guilt was taken care of, but for us, guilt is taken care of, and then the power comes. See how that is? You see, I'm pretty deep into it, and I don't know how much further I can go, but I know one thing. Let's just bring it down to this. Mm. Let's bring it down to this. He designed this plan for us that we not only are cleared with God judicially, but that we have the same power He had when He walked this earth. He even said greater things you shall do. So I said, I don't want your minds to be blocked up because I'm saying some great big things. But He designed this so that if you and I deny self in Him, as Christ work, works within us, He will be living in, in with us. And we can defeat the devil just like he did on the Mount of Temptation. Why? How? Just by the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And the power... See, see, we got an idea of self-denial. Sounds like a lot of self-effort. It just it means make up your mind and say no to the devil. It's not your power that's going to win it. But when you say no to the devil, something else moves in. His name's Jesus. And brother, it doesn't matter if it's the amount of temptation or what it is, and we'll never be called upon to do what He did in the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't have to bear the sins of humanity. It's already been done. Our sins have been born. But we do have to say no to the devil, and we do have to surrender because this power is not available. And this is Brother Hymn's ministry. Until we identify with Him, until our old man is nailed to the tree, until we surrender all and we're willing to say no... And then, not only judicially is the guilt taken care of, but the power of God comes into our life. And when we say no, God's power is there to strengthen us and we can defeat the devil and walk a holy life and and victory after victory after victory after victory till one indeed can walk moment by moment with Christ. Even in the justified life, and you don't make it to the sanctified life, entire sanctification, without doing it. A man that is saved and still has a carnal nature has the power to say no to the devil. And if you see, they were singing about choices. Give him the, give him the best of your heart. You say no to the devil. The mighty power of God is there to help you to whip the devil and to send him running and get him gone for a while. For it said the devil left him for a season. He snuck back through Peter. He snuck back through this. And see, he came through this because he was a man. He was tempted in all points and he was gaining strength. He was learning obedience by the things he suffered. He was becoming, he was becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. You see, he was developing, developing, developing. I explained it like the muscle. Until he could go into Gethsemane by himself say, Not my will, but thine be done. And I'll tell you, every victory he had before then could not have been possible. That is, Gethsemane was not possible without a mountain temptation. Gethsemane was not possible until he could say no to Peter. Gethsemane was not possible until he could say, I've got to go through Samaria. Gethsemane was not possible until he won all these victories, for he was becoming perfect. And that's a perfection of development. He was becoming adequate to the task. 
because He needed to grow in the flesh. He needed to feel what we feel. He needed to have these victories in the flesh and the possibility of losing. He had to have that also. But He had to have the possibility of choosing and He had it. So the blood of the cross points to the disposition of Christ. And there's the value. Not the timbers. The power was in the blood. But the blood of the cross is a phrase as God has anointed Paul points to the disposition of Christ, which was the cross. And he never had his own way. He never was self-assertive. Now, now Brother Helm's message doesn't seem so severe, does it? When he says we mustn't disobey God one time. Now it doesn't seem so severe. See, see, we're so caught up with popular preaching which tells about our guilt being removed. Hallelujah, the way is pure with God. But there's another aspect, and that is, it says that He is the author of salvation to all those who obey Him. All those who are willing to put their self-life on the line. Because He lived, He demonstrated a way to victory. But you can't be a self-assertive and get it. When you're self-assertive, you throw everything out of line. You say, what am I going to do about sin's past? Well, He provided for that too. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light, when we start walking, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Every bit of it, brother. Let me tell you, it is possible to have victory for every temptation that comes up. And that's the sons of God He's looking for. That's the church He's looking for. That's the two or three He's looking for. And th- that possibility came because of the blood of the cross. Would to God that I could have gotten that ten years ago. It was available to me. But the mind could hardly accept that a man could live for Christ moment by moment in the unsanctified life. He can. The power may keep the old carnal nature down. <laughs> it's the, it keeps it down. It may not, the principle may still be there. But God has the power for any person who's a new creation in Christ to give him victory at every moment along the way. And if he won't choose for himself, then the power of God is available to him. Now that... That is a little of what Jesus is helping me to see in the blood of the cross. It's a way of life. Paul put it this way, and I've never preached on this passage, and I'm not going to now, but I can end with it. It's so great. Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ... Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that is, in my humanity, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then I like these next words, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Would to God that I had the ability to be a better communicator, but you quit, you keep praying for me. Just a little light on the blood of the cross that gave me revelation clear back on what happened when I got down off that mountain and the devil was after me. And just before I got on the bus, I turned around and I said, Jesus, because you overcame there, I can overcome now. I was right with the cross because the cross was manifested then. He didn't assert himself. He relied on the power of God, and the victory came. Even though what he was baited over was legitimate. Wrong timing. Wasn't done in God's way. Bread and kingdoms and all. He turned it down, and God's power gave him the victory. Can you see why I'm a little excited about remembering some experience? Some experience you've had in Jesus. You may not understand it, right now you've got just a little light on it you know it's he'll he'll, he'll give it to you further along <laughs> isn't there an old song further along we'll understand better yes. by and by glory be to God it's more than an old good song it's the truth of God may Jesus sanctify Amen. these these words oh God you've been so faithful to help us again 
to talk to a precious people about the deepest subject we could talk about, which is the blood of Christ, the blood of the cross. And Lord, it's put, a, it's put a desire in my heart to serve Thee. It's put a desire in my heart not to fail Thee once. Oh, God in heaven, hear our cry. We repent. We have not walked with Thee moment by moment. We repent, O oh Lord, that we've ever failed Thee once. When You saved this boy, saved me 40 some odd years ago, to think that I would have ever chosen one moment of self-assertiveness when I could have denied self and known so many things that I've never reaped. But thank God that we triumph through the blood of Christ. Thank God for the forgiveness. Thank God for the cleansing. Thank God that the guilt's been taken care of. And thank God there's power for me to live for Jesus today and to resist the temptations of the devil. Even though it comes so sly, whether it's to visit my grandchild or not, even that must be submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We sanctify this in Jesus' name and we thank you, O oh God, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, for helping us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.